Um, Simona, and Andrea, great to see you. You are Zooming in from Amsterdam, I know. How are things there with you? Everything is, uh, is good. Thank you for inviting us to do this. Uh, it's also sunny today, so quite special. Sort of sunny. Yeah. Nice. The, uh, unusual in October in the Netherlands, I have a feeling. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and just for those who aren't aware, although your reputation precedes you, obviously, uh, can you just say a little bit about why Italians are working in the Netherlands and <laughs> what your geography uh, That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're still wondering about it. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, well, actually, me and Andrea, we met uh, in, uh, in Italy during our studies, during our bachelor, a uh, long, long time ago. In Florence. In Florence. And then we decided to move to the Netherlands to study in Eindhoven, um, a design academy, where now we are actually teaching. And, uh, and our experience in the Netherlands has been positive in the sense that we felt, especially back then, when we started uh, studying that there was a generation here of designers that had more of a voice than in Italy. And so we decided to establish our studio in, uh, in Eindhoven first and then in Amsterdam. And then we got stuck here, apparently. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of, there's a strong gravitational field in the design world. In, yeah. in, in no, it's very good to work from here. Yeah, yeah. but you, you really do have a, a kind of global practice as we'll see both in the subject matter that you undertake, but also mm -hmm. you're, you're very itinerant. I know this year it must be harder for you to travel. Um, but I, I guess before we uh, plunge into the slides, I did want to ask you whether you see the Dutch design context as still in some way defining what you do, or if the Netherlands is really more of a base of operations and you feel much more, um, you know, much more wide ranging than that. Yeah, I think Absolutely. we, yeah, we never been, really belonging. Um, I mean, of course, we, we are here and we love to be here. We are in contact with all the designers here. We teach here, so our life is here, but we, we don't like so much the label Dutch design. We've never been very also connected to that. We don't want in any case to support uh, the- Kind of a nationalistic- uh, uh, Identification of yeah. design, so. Yeah. yeah, even when it's a very positive narrative, like the one that the Netherlands tends to generate around design. Well, it is apparently positive, but we don't think it is positive because whenever you frame something, uh, you say like Dutch design is this thing, inevitably you also frame that everything that is not that thing cannot belong to it. Mm. And, uh, and then we saw that, for instance, uh, happening in Italy when with the rise of the idea of Italian design and understanding in a global market that that can be a label that can be sold, then inevitably uh, in our world, framework is constructed mm -hmm. and that's the same happening with Dutch design because it is also a way of uh, selling a you know a, a, as I said a, a label and uh, whenever you sell something you need to define it to narrow it down and that creates boundaries that should never be there mm, yeah that's very well said so a, a kind of anti-nationalism um, is yeah. essential to think about you know the ideals of freedom as they might be expressed in the discipline yeah. Yes, and also, the, you know, by nature, design has the possibilities and the limitations to act and to, and to, think, to think on a on a global level. And I would say that there is an international community of designers that works affected by the works of others beyond the geopolitical um, framework of, you know, that we usually uh, define things with. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll get back to some of those themes, particularly when we get to some of your research, research projects, recent research projects, uh, Cambio and Ore Streams. But uh, let's go ahead and start uh, the story a little bit earlier. Maybe the, the first thing I could actually ask you about is the name, Forma Phantasma. It's such a cool, interesting, distinctive name. Um, now we're so used to it that maybe people don't even wonder about it anymore. But to me, it suggests obviously the idea of form, form giving being a word for design in the Netherlands and other countries, and then this idea of fantasy. But what else was combined in this phrase for you when you chose it for your project? Well, the, that's the interesting thing is that it's not really about fantasy. It's actually the opposite of fantasy. Hmm. <laughs> in the sense that phantasma in Italian means ghost. So it is actually the combination of the idea of form, which is very much about the, you know, the reality of giving shape to something and and um phantasma it's actually the opposite the yeah the form. absence of it and mm -hmm. 
it is more of a reference of our way of working that it is based on a process and then the form depend on on, a, on, the, on the consequences of a research or of a process and it's not really about sitting down on the table and giving form to to and, and sculpting uh, objects mm, okay uh, the the word spirit springs to mind or geist would be the german like zeitgeist for example yeah. the spirit of the time so the the sense that um maybe we could look at the the first body of work which is called botanica as a way to emblematize this there's a sense that the real focus is on the process and the thinking trajectory mm -hmm. and the objects are more like the residue or the outcome of of, mm -hmm. that, of that process and so they're invested with that spirit would that be a good way of thinking about it absolutely i think so yeah. yes at least uh, this is definitely you know when we started working specifically also with botanica this was really the the kind of processes we were following and even some of these objects they haven't been drawn on paper they have been just shaped uh, literally by the process of making, but also by the process of, of the thinking about the ideas of the project itself. Yeah. Probably this was one of the most intuitive projects we did uh, at, the, at the beginning, because we got the commission from an Italian foundation was called Plart, it's called Plart. And it's a foundation that is dedicated to the restoration of objects in plastic. So uh, quite an interesting things because, you know, plastic has been considered all the time a material from, from the present, from now. Uh, but and from the future, but of course, plastic, it's a, a old century material. It's already, it's, they, we already started to make plastic in the 19th century. And of course, there is a lot of restoration uh, issues uh, also with contemporary design uh, object. And this, mm, this foundation in Italy is really dedicated in understanding how to recuperate the, these objects. And they, you know, they contacted us because they want to to do a project with us with object in plastic. So it was a very vague and quite um, open, open right. commission at the beginning. But of course, as soon as we got to the commission, then we, uh, we put it all on our side. Mm. We thought it was interesting to look back to when the idea of plasticity emerged. You know, when we talk about plastics, we, we, it, it's just a process of continuous engineering of, um, of materials. Uh, and then when you look back and you realize and the, there is a, you know, of course, that there is a history into it. And specifically, we look at doll plastics that were emerging by researchers and scientists and craft people before the introductions of oil uh, into the production of, of polymers. And, um, and specifically, we uh, revived some of these ways of producing plastic uh, uh, materials. Uh, using natural shellac, which is excrement the insect deposits on trees in, in the uh, Southeast Asia, mm. and uh, Bois d'Urcy, which is a, a 18th century uh, French invention that mixes uh, sodas and animal blood or agalbumin to make, to, um, with high pressure and steam, mm -hmm. it, the, the, the proteins contained in albumin or in, in blood binds the fibers together and many other raisins of vegetal origins. Mm -hmm. And of course, for us, this was a way of exploring the, the sort of the organic side of this, this story, but also to, um, there is an element of retrofuturism mm -hmm. about this, this project because we were sort of wondering mm -hmm. what would have happened to these materials if oil-based uh, um, polymers were not stepping in the production process of plastics. So the objects are on purpose designed with... With the opposite, it's like aesthetic of how usually objects in plastic are. You know, usually they are like shiny and perfect and these are actually completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, with plastic we do most of very utilitarian, I mean, also very throwaway objects, but these are instead like very de decorative um, objects that they are uh, texturized, they are um, really referring to a word that is not the one that they are usually connected to plastic. Mm. I remember when I, I think first met you guys uh, visiting you in the studio, you were working on this project and your studio was something like a kitchen or a mad scientist laboratory. There were things bubbling away on burners. Yes. And, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but it, it just makes me think about the shift in design practice that I think you represent so well, which is, as you were saying already, this move away from object forming to thinking about technique and process and craft mm -hmm. as the wellspring from which the object will, will come. But it really has led you to be almost like scientists or technologists 
um, or we might just say materialists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a, for us. It was an uh, an, an instinct. In, uh, sorry, uh, our instinct played an important role here in the way we develop our practice because I think there was definitely since the beginning interest into materiality, both I would say on a uh, on a physical, physical yeah. level, on really on an aesthetic level even, um, but then more and more it grew, becoming a much more programmatic approach where we look into the sourcing of materials as we were doing this project, also to understand the politics that shapes the design discipline and the making of things, mm. which is something that we explore in several different in the, several different works. So this intuitive nature of our work shifted in something much more. I, I think aware of the way that inevitably the design discipline is complicit to an existing infrastructure of extraction, distribution, and forming of materials. Because whenever we want to de deliver a material outcome or a product to a possible user, inevitably we are supporting or using that infrastructure. And yeah. all these projects that we develop over the years that are about materials are actually really looking into the relationship for instance, between locality and and uh, the extraction of materials and the natural fossilium is one example. Yeah, but before to go maybe to the natural fossilium, I want to add something because uh, Botanica was also for us one of the first projects we did, in, indeed in which we did like a material investigation that in a way wanted to connect to a broader audience, also a broader industry. With Botanica, we really were not able to do it. I mean, we, we did a kind of like, a, we kept going with the investigation with drug design and they connected us with the Wageningen University and we tried to, to test the material to, to see if they could have like a life in industrial production, but we were not really able to do it. While with the Natural Fossilium, the project that we are now going through, it's uh, something that instead- uh, Over the happened. years we managed to find this bridge. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose that's a natural development in the practice, but it also exactly. maybe reflects a change that was happening around you where industry was, and of and design channels at museums, magazines, galleries mm -hmm. were becoming much more friendly to this idea of a kind of autonomy from the extraction uh, chains that you were just describing, I suppose. Um, so let's talk about the Natura uh, Facilium then. Um, this is very much a, a project that's focused on the question of extraction, which will be with us <laughs> uh, throughout the rest of the talk in a way. So how do we, uh, how do we extract resources from the world and use them? And what are the ethics of that? So perhaps you could explain the kind of rationale uh, behind the project. Yeah, well, this work was, um, it started many, 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 many years ago. Uh, first as a fascination of me and Andrea because Andrea is Sicilian and we often go there. And the world work is based in basically on a specific location which is the Athena Volcano in Sicily and it was a work that then has been supported by uh, Libby Sellers uh, uh, when Libby was involved with, uh, with a gallery. And um, we were fascinated by the idea of a, a place that is a volcano, which is usually used as a form of entertainment for tourists. It is a beautiful landscape, of course, and it's as typical in a lot of Mediterranean uh, areas of Europe, people see the landscape as a form of entertainment. Mm. But for us as designers, what was interesting is that the mountain, which is an active volcano, it looks more like an, a, a location for production because the volcano is exploding quite regularly and uh, exposing materials and, and debris and ashes. And um, we, uh, and I have to say, because you, Andrea, because you're Sicilian, uh, it is quite common in, in the surroundings of, of the volcano to have to deal with the nature of this place and which is quite obviously passive mm -hmm. and instead we were wondering well actually what can we do literally with this materiality which is available which was very uh, inspiring for us because of course it is non-extractive mm -hmm. you know it is about the mountains that mines itself and expose materials and it's not about humans and you know, digging in the underground. Um, and it's really raining from the sky. I mean, when there are eruptions, and for instance, this is the one that we witnessed while we were developing the project. Um, I mean, like all the streets around the volcano, but I mean, also even quite far from the volcano, like 70 kilometers from, far from the volcano, all the streets are completely covered by debris. So mm -hmm. it's something that is really there. And I mean, people are using it nowadays, like more as a, 
way of fertilizing the, the ground. So the ground is very fertile because of this um, uh, debris, but practically has never been used as a material for design. It's so interesting because you would normally think of the volcano, um, particularly in Italy, with Vesuvius and so on, um, as, as destructive, but thinking of it as generative and as this being like a natural smokestack of a kind of gift-giving uh, organic factory. That's really, it's a really great way of turning the... Uh, yeah, exactly. Up. I mean, the first time we visited um, the volcano, actually, Simone visited the volcano, we went to the um, souvenir shop, like in the... On, on top of, of the mountain. And they had these like 70s um, Ashtray. ashtrays that they were actually produced molting directly the lava into a mold uh, in, uh, um, mm. on top of the volcano. Uh, because at that moment, actually, the volcano was uh, uh, erupting in a, an effusive way. So it was a way, um, it was erupting in a way that you could actually go very close to it and really source the, the, the molten lava directly. But now the life of the volcano changes. It's not anymore like a fusive, it's a kind of eruptive in a very strong and bold way. So mm-hmm. we have to change completely the idea. But let's say that that was probably the starting, the starting point, point. When, yeah, yeah. when we went. And we collaborated with uh, several uh, locations and expertise, like with craftspeople in the Netherlands, in, uh, in Venice, uh, in terms of uh, glass production, because one of the things we realized melting samples of ashes within uh, a kiln that we had in the studio is that the result was similar to glaze so a glass like uh, um, material and so we the objects that we are looking at at this moment is some of the outcomes of that process that we realized that we could produce a black glass so you might wonder like you know what is interesting for us it's not the fact that you can produce black glass but it's interesting for us that from that location from that non-extractive source you this is the outcome mm. uh, you know it's not it's not about um it's not that we're predicting the aesthetic yeah. out, outcome of this investigation but we're interested in in understanding what we could do with that location specifically yeah. that of course on a client level i think it can be also quite problematic i remember we had a lot of discussion with Libby and Libby, I mean, she was fantastic to work with. She was never preoccupied about, you know, us delivering. But of course, till the end, you know, we didn't know what to do because, uh, you know, the material was also so unpredictable. So mm-hmm. for instance, you saw before the, those kind of boxes um, and we also did some blown um, uh, object, um, um, but it was very difficult to, to get there. So mm-hmm. at the end, we have to go into more um, casted, uh, casted glass. And that's why the geometry of the object resembled, for instance, um, uh, I would say Art Deco or even um, Memphis-like or Sotsos pieces in a way, which was also the, the, the outcome of that process. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I was going to ask you about that question of aesthetics and style, because mm-hmm. on one level, you're using these very... I would almost say generic forms like the vases yeah. and botanica or we'll call them archetypical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a little actually like the Heliongarius vase form when she yes. works with color, yes. something very neutral that becomes a canvas, or the box yeah. is a sort of pure geometry that allows you to fore- foreground the materiality. But then when we get to something like this, it does have that kind of art deco quality. And then even in Botanica, you were using these addendums and decorations that are very extravagant in a way. And I, I wonder if you could just talk about the question of, I don't know if I want to use the word taste, but the kind mm-hmm. of aesthetic proposition yeah. that you bring to what yeah. was otherwise a very um, material-based story. Yeah, well, the, there might be a taste, of course, in the objects we do, but of course we don't think about, and we don't worry about taste or aesthetic necessarily. Mm-hmm. but more about uh, thinking, especially back then to this object, as narrative elements. So there's always narrative components and mm-hmm. decorations are what we can call the decorations of us are narrative elements. Mm-hmm. So in the case of Botanica, for instance, the uh, exuberances of some of the forms were literal uh, also um, form of um, reference to the process of making but also to the origin of the material so to the for instance to the um, organic and, and botanical mm-hmm. world in the case of the natura fossilium it's the outcome of a process but also for instance uh, 
I can tell you that at the beginning we were thinking that the work would have been much more about organic forms. Mm -hmm. Because of course, when you think about the volcano and the lava, you know, it's sort of But obvious. then all the project was about controlling it, you know, like uh, forcing into a grid. So mm -hmm. also the kind of aesthetic that we use, it was really it because of, that. yeah, it became about yeah. this trying to trap it. Grids and containment and geometric forms and, um, and uh, but for instance, now we have in front this, this little coffee table. One of the, the way we started working with these objects that are in basalt actually, it's looking at the stratas in um, where, uh, geological stratas where um, this material is extracted. Mm. And um, at the base, there is the more um, porous stone and the more compact at the top. The combination of the two is also for us a narrative element, but at least for us, because the more compact is the, the oldest uh, eruption and the more gasos is the most recent eruption. So all the object has this also a literal way of understanding the landscape within the object. Yeah, so you're almost diagramming the stratigraphy. Exactly. Geology and the object. Yes. I, I also yes. love the way that there's this, uh, this plane that kind of goes down vertically, which almost seems like it stands in for your intervention into that geography. <laughs> I don't know if you like That's that. a very, way, very <laughs> good way of putting it. Yeah, but, but it, it's, it's fascinating the way that these otherwise very formalist, I wouldn't say modernist because I agree they're, they're not, you know, they're not conventionally modernist because they allude to these more permissive movements like Art Deco and postmodernism, which are much more wide open than Bauhausian modernism. Um, and there's a kind of freedom in the palette that you're using and the forms, but they also have that kind of diagrammatic quality to, to them. It's a really fascinating combination. Um, so you were saying that this project actually marked a new threshold in your work and that it did have more of a, a successful distribution system or, or, or was sort of um, uh, more successful commercially, is that right? Well, it's not really about commercial success. I would say that it's more about the fact that we managed to take this investigation, which is of course becoming a collection of objects, but it is also just a research in terms of materials. Mm -hmm. And we managed to take the material investigation uh, into that location and keeping in mind this idea of non-extractive resources um, and we, in, a, um, in another project we did that is called um, uh, Ex Cinere, we applied this uh, investigation on the ashes as a glazing material for tiles for architecture. So mm -hmm. more of a large scale product. But now that we have this picture in front of us, maybe I can, I want to add something mm -hmm. about uh, the, formality, the formal quality of the, of the work. For instance, in this case, there is literally some decorative components on the pieces. But the fact that all the vessels are came combined with elements of the of the rocks or the ashes, it's because we really wanted to implement in the object the raw material and its processed version. Mm. So it, the object somehow implements often mm -hmm. also the the process of the making. Yeah. So you have different stages in the process present in the finished object. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And first, that tiny colored piece. It's just a piece of glass that we found around when we were working in Venice. And it was wonderful because think of, of working glass in Venice. And it, when you think about glass and Venice, it, it is all about these pastel colors, this fluid glass, you can do whatever you want with it, with these centuries old, you know, centuries old techniques that has been engineered from the most amazing craftsmen. And we were working with this unpredictable black material. And for us, somehow it was sort of, beautiful also to take within the object this narrative also the locations we work in yeah and so this tiny piece of transparent glass from venice ended up being part of the work yeah it's interesting because it also comes across as a kind of industrial sample like here's the glass that you <laughs> use you know and yeah. then the the black glass platform almost looks like a pallet a pallet like yeah things you know things sitting on things which is such a common uh, experience in a factory. So at the same time, that is a very refined, very refined object and very, very calibrated and specific. It also does remind you of these somewhat chaotic production scenarios that you might experience. Which it was, it was, it was extremely chaotic. It was extremely chaotic. 
But also, I mean, it's fine if you see like all the, the vases, you know, this is the only vase they actually came out quite well. The yes. rest, they were completely molten. And then we actually went into the casting of glass because it was the easier way, easiest way yeah, to, to do it. Yeah. 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 I suppose that's, that's the glory of those situations, right? Is the chaos, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Simone, you just mentioned Xcenere, which is this more industrial application. And I, I guess we should say this is a collaboration with Brent Zecorius uh, through exactly. yeah. Zek, D-Z-E-K, which is, um, he has such an interesting uh, project going there. So maybe you could describe that as well as the specific Yes, absolutely. So Brent uh, and, and his uh, brand is, are both extremely interesting persons and ideas in there because uh, he is establishing a brand that is focusing on material investigations and the applications in architectural materials. And we think that that is, of course, extremely suiting our own way of working. And this was the second installment for, for Brent. The first one was with um, Max Lamb. And he was extremely interested uh, since the beginning uh, when he saw the, the work that we were developing with, uh, with Libby, the Natura Facilium, because he saw immediately a similar, they were kind of spirits in, in a way. And he invited us to develop a work with him. And we told him like, hey, Brent, great if you want to continue working on this and we, but i tell you it's going to be very difficult and very long you know it's it's going to be a process and he was like yes but don't worry so i have experience in this said, okay great and then after a while he was starting to you know really realizing what we meant and how difficult it <laughs> but is but the good thing is that you it actually was motivating us because at a certain moment we were really like okay yeah. we don't want to do it anymore it's too difficult Oh. And, then, and then he pushed for it because yeah. honestly the whole work went through different stages so at the beginning we were working on exploring the idea of, of glass, glass. Mm. Uh, with him. And then we worked also with a factory in, in, um, in Turkey. Turkey. We, made, we engineered the glass, everything was going. But the, the scale of the intervention needed really like an industrial mm, huge application. Like it was becoming something that we could not handle personally. Mm -hmm. and and so basically we went back to something we were up to the first samples we had in the studio so when we were really working initially uh we used to melting the ashes we were melting them on top of porcelain bodies you know that's what you do to to see the the reaction of how mm -hmm. the material melts and so we branched start, we started exploring this idea of using as a glazing um as a glazing material because again, one of the things that characterize glazes is that uh, very often, if not in all cases, you use minerals that are extracted from the underground. So we thought that for us, it was extremely important in this project to investigate this idea of non-extractive materials for glazing, but also again, to investigate the aesthetic outcome that comes from rooting a project into a location. Mm. So whenever we were speaking with the, with the companies we worked with to develop the project, we were all the time saying, what is the aesthetic outcome that you want? And we said, like, we don't want any aesthetic outcome. We just want to follow this process. Exactly. Let the material speak. And, and then uh, and say what is relevant for us is sticking to this idea of this location and what, what comes out of it. And which is extremely interesting because um, I guess it, it somehow reversed it puts a different priority, you know, it, for, for people developing products that are used to work with design, it is difficult to work with designers. They don't understand design when it is not about the formal or, or an aesthetic outcome. You know what I mean? Why would we depart from an idea? So this was what was challenging also for, for this work. Huh. Because they, they expect you to come in and give it some specific extravagant form that will do the communicating, but you want the communication. No, or, or it, or they were saying, how do you want the glazes to look? And we were like, let's see what happened when you put it in the kiln. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's really part of experimenting with it. Mm. So, and of course, when we do it within our own studio, in our kiln, we can try out. But when we need to discuss with people, they're not into trying out, but they are just, you know, good in buying uh, uh, existing um, glazes and then applying on ceramic. Of course, the kind of like way of establishing this course is completely different. Yeah. It does seem to me, um, and again, it might be hard for people to see in, in these images, but the quality that you get in the surface is perhaps more beautiful and more alien and unfamiliar than anything you could possibly imagine without having yeah. done it. 
Definitely. I mean, the, of course, the, there's plenty of brown tiles around, but there is a depth in the glaze here that is more peculiar. Yeah. And also, the, the, it is both about the aesthetic outcome, of course, but it is also about the, the, the process that, gives, that adds value to the product, I think. Mm -hmm. And what's the current status of Xcinere as a project? Is it something you've been able to apply in architectural situations yet? Yeah. yeah, yes, of course, the pandemic slowed down a lot, the situation. So we have a project, quite a large pro the, the ties has been, they are, they are available in the market. They have been applied in, in several applications, both in public spaces and also private uh, uh, houses. And there is a project that is in the pipeline, actually already designed for a big um, lobby. Hall, yeah. lobby for a um, office space in London that will open in 2020. Two, I think, mm -hmm. or N21. Yeah, N21. Uh, N21, actually. Oh, super. Because I, I would love to know what it would be like to be surrounded by these. <laughs> you know, feel like you're in the belly of Mount Etna. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, let's, let's now move on to our last two projects, which are both uh, of, of a similar kind in the sense that they're very ambitious research undertakings that look at uh, a large-scale global industry or sort of commodity chain. So we're going to begin with Cambio, which is an inquiry into another kind of extraction, which is timber extraction. Um, so we're going to start here in the Val de Fiam. So can you explain this place and what it has to do with the project? Yeah. So uh, maybe I, I, I should mention that uh, Cambio is a, an exhibition that was commissioned by Serpentine Galleries. Yes. And so the, the, also the outcome is very different than other commissions that we received because of course it is, the outcome is the exhibition. So we also acted somehow as, as curator of the, of the show. Mm. And um, uh, this place is in Val de in northern, northern Italy. And um, two years ago, because of like a huge storm, um, practically the entire forest was like more than 40 million of trees completely blown uh, down in uh, in one night practically mm, as we and, mm -hmm. yeah. and we wanted to start to use this as a starting point for the show because um it we what we find interesting is that that is a planted forest uh, as the majority of forests in the world honestly and uh and as you can see from the remaining trees they're all the same of the same height which is what tells you when basically it was planted. And from the forest, of course, uh, timber is extracted and some of this timber is also used to produce a highly valuable uh, Stradivari violins. And uh, we find, we thought it was important to start with this, with this place because you could immediately see the effect of climate change and production into the environment and yeah. production yeah. Yeah. and um, we visited the location and we use also the material from this valley for the creation of the display system for the exhibition mm -hmm. and um, yeah it was an extremely shocking experience to to be there honestly i'm sure yeah the scene of devastation um so you had mentioned that that particular timber was used in instrument uh yeah Sure. So it has these very particular qualities that are much prized. Um, but you're also thinking about what I want, what I almost want to call a debased form of materiality, where mm -hmm. you, you feel like the wood is being processed into all of these different forms and you're sort of mapping them in the course of the exhibition. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you talk a little bit about the investigation of the whole system that you were uh, undertaking? Yeah. Yeah. I think with, with Cambio we, and with all streams that we are going to probably speak about it later, it's where our attitude become much more programmatic and much clearer, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that for the first time, you know, we really uh, took the consequences of our previous work and really trying to understand them in depth. And uh, here it is not anymore just a fascination for the possibilities of a material and its relation to a context but it is also much more understanding the broader implication and structure and governance of an industry, in this case, the wood extraction. And we did, and we did so in com collaborations and conversation with a variety of practitioners that usually are not part of the design discipline. So the exhibition features the works of uh, scientists that, that are working with wood anatomy. So the exploration, the understanding of wood, analyzing their its anatomy, 
with endoclimatology, so people that, that understand climate patterns through the reading of uh, tree rings, with institutions that uh, studies the relationship between uh, CO2 intake from trees and their transformation into products, with institutions such as the Kew Gardens uh, and the Victoria and Albert Museum, with NGOs in developing countries such as Colombia, with a philosopher as uh, Emanuele Cocha, and activists. with activists. Yeah. Mm. All this to uh, understand really which are the politics that shapes the industry in an extremely important industry that we as designers uh, daily, uh, in, in our daily practice, we end up using and supporting. Yeah. Not only to analyze the problematic side of this industry, but also to uh, gain knowledge that can be useful to uh, come up with different design attitudes and different design briefs whenever we work mm. or whenever we consult or we work for other companies. Mm. So I think Cambio is in fact a both an educational model, I would say, because we also apply it uh, in, um, as an educational model for the geodesign department where we teach, but also it shows a clear attitude that we think can also be applied, for instance, in companies that deal with these materials. What I mean to say is that with this body of knowledge, we and with this attitude, we can think, for instance, of how, for instance, a business model could be different, or how a product can be different designed to to uh, really become uh, ecological and a more realistic perspective than just choosing a material that supposedly is ecological. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing that strikes me about the project too is that it um, maybe a little bit unlike the Denethera Facilium, which is about the gift of the volcano. Here you're really exploring the contingencies and implications that designers and manufacturers necessarily have. So it's not mm -hmm. this sort of unusual situation where the earth gives you a material that you can work with that's non-extractive. Here you're really thinking about what it means to be navigating an extractive situation and how you might think about that and how you might um, sort of guide your own ethical compass through that situation. So it seems absolutely. absolutely. I mean, of course, the exhibition, it has also a kind of a, a bit of a didactic aptitude. But for us, it was also quite important. First, because like uh, the Serpentine as a location is within a park. So there are a lot of people that are not even related to design. They are entering in. And then also because I think for us, it was almost important to start from the beginning, you know, like, and for instance, these are beautiful images of um, the Xilarium of the Kew Garden. And it's interesting that, you know, those beautiful uh, blocks of uh, wood that we find, we see in the photos, in any case comes from exploitation of resources during colonial time. And they've been mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the foundation actually of the design discipline. So, um, and they have represented yeah, the sorry. foundation of the design discipline because the, 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 the samples were also exhibited in the, the great exhibition, great exhibition. Uh, of the 51. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and through the selling of the tickets of that exhibition, also the Victoria Lambert Museum was founded. Well, and and also, also the Xilarium was founded. And the Serpentine is sitting right next to the site. Right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so for us, it was quite important to kind of bring back that context uh, in, the, uh, in the park. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Because um, I actually had the chance to visit the Economic Botany Collection, it's called, at Kew, myself. Um, and uh, you just feel like you are literally in the attic of the empire. It's sort of, here's yeah, exactly. the stuff that we got from everywhere. And they have these amazing characterful old labels that we can see here. But you really feel like this is the harvest of the British Empire's campaign yeah. of exploitation across but the interestingly enough that already like in the 19th century 18th century actually most of those those uh, trees um, they were already like uh, uh, gone so there are like some etiquette especially in this part of the exhibition these were the wood from the uh, great exhibition and you know already in the in the uh, in the etiquette it was written that those trees were um, extinct, uh, extinct. So again, you know, we know we are aware about these things since, uh, you know, 300 years and yeah. you know, we almost didn't do anything for it. So can I ask you a question about the way this show looks to you now, having done it and knowing what's happened in 2020? Um, yeah. Because yeah. Um, uh, the, the, sorry, this is just a still from a video from the show, but um, I guess what, what I want to ask you about is 
the way that our uh, understanding of this global situation has been changed by the pandemic and being isolated from the usual um, connections that you were mapping in the show. Mm -hmm. the, well, you know, of course, we opened the exhibition the 4th of March. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think after two weeks, the exhibition was, of course, closed because of COVID. Um, but I think that, uh, of course, the exhibition was affected by it. Now it is, uh, fortunately, it is reopened again. And it will stay open till basically the end of the year. Um, but the, uh, I think what was, uh, we were fortunate enough is that we thought since the beginning, as the exhibition as a body of knowledge that should be shared through a variety of different media and supports. So we never thought that the exhibition was the, the thing. Uh, and, and so because of it, we developed a um, quite an extensive catalog that contains some materials that is not in part of the exhibition. And prior of the exhibition opening, without knowing, of course, of the pandemic, we also developed a website, which is Cambio.website, website, where you can see the exhibition uh, documented. But there is also all the extra content that didn't work in the format of um, of an exhibition that can still be shared with uh, with others, because the idea of the exhibition is also that it is a body of knowledge. It is not only ours, but it should be also appropriated by others that might be interested in looking into it. Mm, okay. And, and do you feel like um, there, I mean, this is a highly speculative question maybe, but do you feel like the events of 2020 have in a way prepared the audience to receive this message in a different way than perhaps would have been otherwise, mm -hmm. if not for COVID-19? I mean, I really hope so. <laughs> yeah, but I have to say, yes. I mean, we also see the, in the requests we had from companies after we, we exhibited the work that they are, I mean, not all of them, but some companies are coming not only because they are interested in our aesthetic side, but they are also interested in our thinking. Mm -hmm. So for instance, now we are in, discuss in discussion with um, a very interesting uh, Northern European country in order to, um, company. company, sorry, um, industrial design company. Uh, because they're interested in the process of Cambio and to see how we can implement that into their, their own, their own uh, brand. So I, th I think uh, this time of reflection for sure help people yeah. and company to rethink their model for sure. I mean, yeah, for sure. But also it is evident that we can no longer um, divide the complex entanglements between design and the environment. Mm. And the virus is showing us clearly the consequences, for instance, of deforestation and how species that should enter in the urban environments, they enter and virus, I mean, uh, you know, yeah. is causing spillovers and so on. So um, I think the exhibition is, it was sadly timing, but also extremely relevant in the moment that it happened, I think. Yeah. You know, um, I just want to highlight one thing that, that um, you said, Andrea, which is that there are now companies that are interested in folding this kind of thinking into their brand, mm -hmm. which, you know, brand is maybe a harsh word that pe gets people's backs up a little bit. But mm -hmm. I, I would argue anyway, I don't know what you think about this, that unless design companies and manufacturers do absorb this kind of thinking into their brand identity and their way of doing things and... Um, the particular way in which they do capitalism, the situation that we're in just won't change because the economy of scale require the private sector to embrace this sort of uh, self. Yeah. I mean, you, you touched upon into the main problem. In, yeah. in fact, I completely agree with you that uh, there is a scale of intervention to change things that is not possible while we don't rethink capitalism. So that's obvious. But we can also think about different scales of intervention. Solutions are never, there's never one solution but to problems, but there's always the need of a multitude mm -hmm. of solutions that act in different time scales. Mm -hmm. So if we can make a company that is still based on a capitalist growth model a bit more sustainable or aware of how to make uh, more ecological choices, that will it, it will in any case a, be a positive uh, improvement and 
uh, in changing the culture from within. Mm. Is that is that the solution? No, no. Yeah. but it is a, a, a small triggering point. We often make this metaphor, or it's not a metaphor, but we visualize problems in this way as a gigantic body. And, and, and the climate problem is it is a gigantic body and only with an acupuncture of several interventions we can cure it. Mm. It's never about one solution. And it's also about a small scale solution it is top down the results so the bottom up you know what i mean it's never one thing it is a multitude i i love that um analogy uh is it an analogy a metaphor whatever it is yeah <laughs> i think it is an analogy bro but i love the, the idea that a whole design practice could be like one acupuncture needle that goes mm, into the yeah. body of the problem and the kind of precision that that implies and the focus that it implies and it also helps you realize that you know, if enough people work on it together, each in their own location. Exactly. Except exactly. that their own scale is quite tiny, like the needle point, but they are still working on the problem. Um, yeah. yeah, because this it's the scary part of like a huge issue, like the ecological one is that, you know, of course, us as a studio, we are not making any difference. But if you start to have like thousands of us, maybe, you know, it will eventually. It's also the shift in consciousness that a high profile design um, practice like yours might have. So there's unpredictable yeah. ripples that uh, emanate from what you're doing. Well, let's finish off by talking about Aura Streams, which um, to me anyway, seems like a somewhat parallel endeavor, mm -hmm. but looking at a different materiality. So the materiality of the electronics industry. Um, yeah. and I suppose it's a good way to finish because of course, in, in so much as we might be sitting on wooden chairs, we're depending on the the timber industry, but right now we're actually exactly. zooming on computers. So exactly. we are totally implicated in this story. So maybe good to say that at the beginning. So um, maybe you could just tell us the narrative of this project and, it, and its yeah. outputs as well. It was a work commissioned by the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne and from the Finale in Milano for Broken Nature exhibition, created by Paolo Antonelli. And uh, I'm mentioning this also because the actually starting point of the work was looking into one of the biggest Australian industries, which was the which is the extraction of minerals from the underground. And but we focus specifically on metals. And the, the project, let's say, became more focused in the moment that we realized that um, according to some statistics, that you know, with the recent changes, maybe they're not anymore that precise anymore, but by the end of the century. The majority of resources we will use for, for productions of things in metals, we come from uh, above the surface of the planet because of recycling of metals. Mm -hmm. And so while the recycling of resources is an extremely uh, relevant and important reality, it is often uncharted because it is considered a very positive way of dealing with, with um, resources. Nevertheless, when we talk about electronic waste, there is a reality is extremely complex because uh, uh, electronics are extremely difficult to be recycled. And often, still nowadays, even if there has been international treaties and agreements mm. uh, to fight that, uh, still this um, waste is exported in developing countries to be uh, recycled in very informal ways, which are possibly harmful for the recyclers. and the uh, the environment mm -hmm. and um, we decided to focus uh, also on on the subject because there is also a huge design problem here which is that the the co this complexity in recycling derive also for, from design decisions mm -hmm. so the the work um, is basically a um, constant dialogue and research uh, with uh, a set of different uh, practitioners that, that comes from the uh, production, from the side of production of electronics, the recycling, both in developing and developed. I don't like these words, but from Western world, from Western countries and, and, and uh, non-Western countries and uh, um, uh, lawmakers and people that deal with, with governance of, uh, and the policy making and, um, and and researchers that work at the university and w collecting all these different expertise and of course recyclers, um, collecting all these different expertise uh, and knowledge 
helped us in, in coming up with uh, a series of pragmatic uh, proposals for both the governance uh, of uh, the, how products are designed, but also with very simple strategies that could be applied nowadays to make uh, electronic objects more repairable and recyclable. Mm, okay. So it has both a poetic and a practical register yeah. project. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We also designed some, some, a series of uh, furniture objects. It was a wonderful request to the museum, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria, because they collect uh, furniture pieces. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the objects are not meant to be an illustration or the outcome of the research. It's actually the other way around. We use the production of the object as a Trojan horse to engage with those companies that we were interested also in, in dialoguing with. So companies that, that recycle uh, uh, electronics, but also companies that extract gold from circuit boards that then we use to, to plate some of the details of the object. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, it is a different way of intending the object, not as the uh, solution, but as, the, uh, as, a, as a tool for exploring ideas. Yeah, maybe um, because it's a little hard to read in this photograph, maybe you could explain this particular cabinet, which is a, a, to me a real yeah. uh, uh, emblematic object from the project as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. So what are people looking at exactly here? <laughs> well, it is a, it's a file cabinet, yeah. I would say. And it has been produced using uh, computer cases uh, from a dead stock of a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. um, so they are practically objects. They were, uh, I mean, they were like in a, a, a how do you call it? Like recycling facility. Yeah, recycling facility to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we just ask uh, to give it to us because they were perfect, actually. And the objects are printed with images from uh, from uh, the surface of Mars. Yeah, which is a reference to how um, there are several interests in understanding. <laughs> what Mars is made of, also for uh, uh, exploitation purposes. But also it is a reference to um, the lining of the surface of the Earth, because one of the interesting things that we understood exploring uh, the existence of minerals on, on the planet is that the, some of the precious metals, for instance, that we source, came to exist on the planet because of rains of meteorites that plated the Earth. So for instance, um, mm -hmm. gold is a, in a way of alien origin. So we thought it was interesting to, um, in the work, to zoom extremely in the, the dynamics of uh, production of electronics and so on, but to also have these images of, that moves out from the perspective of the, of even of human perspective within the planet and to, to have this more um, extraterrestrial view almost on the work. Yeah. And the pieces all the time uh, reference the office um, we did um, cubicles um, and office furniture um, because we, uh, well, of course, because also electronics, you know, are extremely important within the office, but also the office is the environment in which the fragmentations of work, the subdivisions of work, of resources, of compiling papers for the transportation of the resources is happening. So mm -hmm. for us, for somehow, the office became the uh, ideal environment where to talk about these issues, compare, for instance, that the home. It's like the natural ecosystem for thinking through. Exactly. Industry. Thank you. Know. you. This yeah. is very well said. Exactly. Um, that's actually our last uh, image. So maybe I could get you guys back on full screen here. And um, as we just get into our Q&A, we just have a couple of minutes. But let me ask a first question. And please, if, if uh, the audience has others, uh, do let us know. But um, I'm curious to know when you're working with these teams of experts, you know, the botanists and the geologists and everyone, I mean, scientists that you're bringing to bear, what, what do you think your own expertise as designers turns out to be in that situation? Because I, I would imagine it must be very clarifying because it sort of exposes what your own contribution in this multi-level conversation is. Yeah. I would say that we see each other more as a connector uh, in the case of uh, when we speak with these people, but also translator, because most of the time, you know, like we speak with uh, scientists and they make amazing research, but they're not very good in um, extrapolating those information and make them available to others. 
than not for the scientific world. So probably one of the things that we try to do the most is try to find ways of make things available and understandable for uh, for for others. The, yeah, for others. But there is also, for instance, in the case of war streams, uh, I would say that what is very important is that we are designers and we can, and our knowledge is, is important in understanding the design problem in that context, so for instance. But also the fact that we are independent actors mm. that can engage with these different practitioners and create those missing links mm. that, are, that are missing. So yeah. it is as simple as that. Yeah. Um, but I would also say that there is a space there that it's the fact that you know, for instance, if you think about also the governance of how to design or how to make how to recycle electronics, inevitably that's also a design question mm -hmm. or designers should be involved in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Designers usually are not involved. Mm -hmm. So um, I think what we add is simply the fact that we are designers. You know what I mean? And we have design perspective and designers are the people that shape things. And so it is important that the people that regulate the industry and the people that shape things should be in much more in-depth conversation than one delivering briefs to the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, almost a definition of how designers could contribute to reshaping the 21st century in fact. So it's just beautifully said. Yeah. Um, let's get a couple of questions. We've got some questions from some friends here. So starting with Libby Sellers, who we mentioned earlier. Um, so Libby has, I'm going to say this is maybe the best question we've ever gotten on the show since we started. <laughs> I'm just going to read it out. She says, so many of your recent projects highlight the positives of open source systems of inf information and shared authorship. And here's why it's the best question. For obvious reasons, I'm reminded of Enzo Mari and his great project, Auto Predizione. Uh, for those that don't know, the great Enzo Mari passed away this last weekend. Um, so very sad uh, moment to lose the, that giant of Italian design. So Libby continues, can you say something about how such generous thinking can be sustained and supported within the current industry that prioritizes the individual creator? And how is this informing your teaching process at the Design Academy also? So maybe two parts, one would be to comment on the legacy of Enzo Mari, and then to talk about how you're integrating this thinking into your teaching. Thanks, All Libby. Right. <laughs> oh, doggy. Excellent question. <laughs> Excellent question, really. Um, so, um, I, I would start from the education because um, it is the simpler. <laughs> um, well, so one of the reasons why we're interested in education is actually because of the, some of the things we talked about before. Some of the things we are interested in um, and some of the implications of our work um, cannot be dealt just by us. And we think that encouraging a generation of designers mm. to work in this direction, it is also a way to think that positive change is not coming from individuals, but it is coming from a collectivity, mm. which is a huge problem because also I think that um, sort of a, the, a capitalist way of thinking also uh, uh, tends to work when you separate individuals you trade them as consumers. And, uh, and in fact, also when you think about ecological development, there is often this narrative where it is the small interventions, the singular citizens that are making a difference, such as recycling your plastic bags or mm -hmm. stuff like that, which is of course important, but it is only with much more um, bigger gesture that we can make change. Right. And for us, working with education is a way yeah. to think that it's our work is not it doesn't end with us but it should continue with others so that change can happen uh, through a community that it becomes larger and larger yeah. also um, research that they are done within a studio like ours can can live out, outside us like for instance the first trimester of geodesign will be about cambio and of course what we did is to bring all the research we did and all the people we, we have been in contact with and we kind of gave these archival of uh, knowledge and we are not th those kind of designers they are we are interested in uh, uh, copyright i don't know how to say like for us it's fantastic if somebody else can yeah. take on our research and bring it into the real world if you're not able to do it or if you're not able to do it in a certain way 
and and that this is our own way to take forward the idea of uh, auto of auto yeah. in a way that of course it is an open source project but it was also an educational project mm -hmm. the idea of Antimari when he did that work was about having the user uh the citizen making by themselves the work not only as a way of owning that idea but also to understand the difficulties of producing quality mm -hmm. he was seeing auto production as a way of educating the users on the struggles of also of making of executing of understanding indeed quality so uh, when we talk about open source of course in design and architecture has been several examples of trying to develop universal state systems that could be applied globally but we think what is interesting of about the idea of open source is in the ideas so we are much more interested in the idea of open source for instance in the scientific model which is about putting the word research that can be applied by others mm. more than, the, than than starting with the idea of open source where there is an author that design a system that can be then later applied and appropriated by others do you know what i mean absolutely like, um and then how it can be sustainable. I think there was also questions about that mm. uh, from Libby, I guess. It was also about- mm -hmm. it Can be sustained, yeah. How can, how can this be sustained? Which is a, also a very good question. Uh, the way we do it is uh, sort of fragmenting our practice in a variety of different uh, scales of intervention. So there is also a commercial side of our practice. Mm. which try to engage with with clients and there is our heavily research-based practice which is now clearly um, out there in the world with cambio and with or strings and um and of course there is the gallery works and the collaborations with uh, justine stagetti with libby with you know galleries we work uh, with we should also um, mention exhibition design because we have incredibly we have a very recent project at the Rijks museum which was such a huge success so no. Exactly, and exhibition design, which is another way for us to to uh, apply our our skills and to take there even our critical attitude, critical attitude. So, for mm. instance, we can all, not always doing that. But for instance, the example of the exhibition design is a way of, of responding to a very practical need. But the way we are trying to think it over time is to also think about the um, how to deal yeah. with ephemerality which is of course a huge problem in terms of ecological uh, mm -hmm. impact of that yeah. um, so our practice always try to bridge our research-based uh, approach with a more uh, obviously commercial outcomes even if we're not really an extremely commercial studio um, and it is a, a struggle but that tension is also what makes it healthy i think yeah so that, that's a great bridge um, and I have to say listening to you it makes me sound like you have maybe have more than one acupuncture needle in your hands <laughs> but uh, but I'll just ask one last question uh, which comes to us from my colleague Stephen Burks uh, co-host of the program this is I think a great final question he says after so many explorations and research and products do you still believe that design is the best creative medium for sharing your ideas so are you still believing yes. design? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. yes, because we are interested in design. Yeah, exactly. In design discipline. Mm. And to unravel all the complexity of the design discipline. I mean, sometimes like, people ask, they are asking us, you know, like, how do you position yourself? Are you more into an artistic practice or a design practice? And we all the time say we are a design studio. You know, like that's mm. for us, it's super important to contextualize our practice in design. And we are definitely interested in, it go even more deeper into the design discipline so definitely yes uh, design is the best creative medium for us but it's also the most interesting because design is sit green between you know the extraction and the refining of material into commodity so mm -hmm. it's the most interesting it's so much uh, tangle uh, with culture with economy with politics that ecology if you're interested I mean, in all these kind of things then design, design is, is the most interesting one to explore well, that's uh, that's an unimprovable place to leave it, of course, uh, in this this program, especially. Um, thanks, guys, so much for uh, being with us today. It's been a fantastic conversation, and uh, I can only wish you the best of luck with all of your ongoing projects. 
Uh, do come back, uh, those of you who are listening in, uh, do come back on Friday. Stephen will be interviewing Omar Sosa from Apartamento. I'm sure you also know. Um, nice. I guess he's going to be zooming in from Portugal, where unfortunately he is under lockdown, but another very itinerant uh, global citizen of the design world. Uh, so come back uh, for Omar on Friday. And um, yeah, thanks again, guys. It's been a, an amazing conversation. Pleasure. Your time. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.